Amen. Thank you, Katie and Brittany, for that, and sweetheart, for playing on the piano. Were you blessed by that? I love that message of the song, There is Joy in the what? In the journey. So how, how's your joy today? Are you joyful today? Are you rejoicing that you could be in God's house? It's good to see some faces back, uh, Gary and Demi. I was a little worried when you took off to Colorado if you were going to come back or not, but I'm glad you came back. I know it's really pretty out there, but it's nice here, too. And, uh, the altitude is too high. Okay, you're too close to heaven there. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. Wow, it's uh, really uh, just a wonderful thing to be in God's house on His holy day and be with God's people. Um, Pastor Ian, I want to share with you uh, that I really enjoyed your story today. I can honestly tell you this, that I, I've been here five years now and I've never seen a spider in the sanctuary. <laughs> I've never seen one in here, but I have seen one or two in the pastor's office, so <laughs> you might uh, say a little extra prayer before you go to the office next time, but uh, I think you'll be fine. I noticed that Oliver, Elizabeth, uh, and Nate, he said he likes spiders, so uh, that's interesting. <laughs> oh, wow. Hey, I just want to share something with you. You probably already know this if you've been attending Standard for a Gap for a while, but this church is a wonderful church family, and the reason it is that way is because we've got good people here, and the only reason we're in any way good is because God is shining through His people. And so uh, today, if you're visiting here for the first time, or maybe this is your second or third time, I'm just going to share this with you, and that is, is that we would love to be your church home. If you're looking for a home, there's a little card in your pew. Uh, it's right there in front of you. You can't miss it. Uh, it looks just like this, and you can fill this card out. Some of you have been doing this, and we get these cards. Nan is wonderful. She helps us with the uh, records, the clerk, and does a wonderful job. But if you uh, would like to join our church, we'd love to have you. So, if, yeah, fill this card out. Give it to me or Nan, or you can put it in that brown box back there, uh, and we'll do what we can to assist you. Uh, Pam, I want to invite you to come up right now. Pam and her team have been doing a wonderful ministry here at Standard for Gap. Um, we've been doing this for a few weeks. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, I know, I know that the Lord is blessing. Uh, it's a ministry that uh, Pam has, uh, let me get your mic here so you can use the mic, uh, that uh, her and her team have been busy out knocking on doors. And uh, so, yeah, just kind of share with us, Pam, what's going on. Well, we just wanted to uh, like keep you updated about the things that are happening out in the field as we're knocking on doors in the neighborhood. Um, we've been working on, uh, I just had it in my head and now I can't remember, um, the Maplewood? Maplewood, Maplewood yeah. yeah. It's not called Maplewood, but the, that area up in there, we just finished it and we started over in this area um, last week. And uh, we were doing uh, Havencrest um, Thursday night. So. We're excited about the things that are happening. We haven't had a lot of rain to, um, to, to keep us under the umbrellas and, and to get our books wet. But um, we have a couple of testimonies, and I just wanted to let the kids like, share a little bit about what's been happening out in the field so that, that you know um, how to pray and who to pray for. And um, so are you ready, Marquise? I could be. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to need a little help on this because I tend to forget things. So basically, there's this. So we knocked on a door, and this lady basically opened the door, and her name was Tina. And so basically, she she was in like a bad spot in her life, and I was like, so I forgot. So basically, um, uh. Yeah, she was praying for someone to come, and right as she finished, we knocked on the door. Oh yeah, and we got to see her the other day. Oh yeah, and Miss Pam, she, Tina's taking a Bible study from her. Amen. Yeah, she was at the church this week. Thank you. Good job. Yeah, and and Morel is um, one of our youth leaders um, this summer. 
So um, he's just got a, something he'd like to say about his job for the summer. Well, it's interesting being a youth leader because I remember when I was one of the students and they were taking me to the door and I had to canvas and just helping them to learn their canvas and to see them go up there and actually do it well and just win souls for God is just amazing to see. Well, we know Whitney's story. Um, Whitney's story is sitting over there from last summer, amazing. And um, so, of course, this summer, you know, has just started. We've just put in the first four weeks, so um, we're excited to do the next half of the summer. And there's a lot more stories coming up. Anne's got an amazing story as our van driver. For next Sabbath, you've got to be here to listen to this story. And I know that Grant has a story so come on over and share with us. Now, Pastor, Pastor Tim isn't here to help you with this. Can you, like, carry on by yourself and tell us what happened? Huh? I can't. You can't do it? I forgot. You forgot. What about the guy that came to the door and said, what do you want? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Talk loud, okay? So this guy, be knocked on his door, and then he, like, said that what Ms. Pam said, and um, then um, we showed him the books, and um, he was interested in the Prince of Peace and the um, Great Controversy. And he thought about taking Bible study, but he already had Bible study at a church. Awesome. The young people are getting out some amazing books this summer and there's there's a light shining all over the neighborhood here and we just want you to pr pray for the young people as they go to the doors um one thing um that we're also trying to ex expand is that the conference has given us cases of books that have been a little bit damaged by the um sorry damaged by the canvassers previous years and so They've given them to us so that the, the young people can get um, add to their um, school tuition. And so what we're going to do is we've, we've been invited to um, different churches on their prayer meeting nights. And we're setting up tables for the, the people to come out and, and take some books at, a, at a, a very greatly discounted price. And the kids are giving a demonstration um, be, before the prayer meeting is over. So... Um, we've been invited to the Chattanooga First Church, and if you know another church that, that you think would greatly benefit from us coming there to do that, we'd be, we, we'd be happy to do it. This Sunday, during the, during the rummage sale, we're going to have tables set up over at the Family Center so that you can come if you'd like to and help the kids by donating for some of these books and make great gifts um, and uh, just... Um, easy giveaways for like neighbors and co-workers and that and you and you can help the kids with their tuition so we appreciate all of your prayers and um, thank you so much god Amen. bless you yeah. well thank you pam and your team doing a great work and the prayers i believe are working so continue to pray for them as they go out and serve um by the way pastor tim would have been up here with them but he's got a migraine headache Ooh. And he chose not to come today. He's probably in a very dark place, <laughs> depending on how bad it is. But uh, pray for him. Uh, yeah, migraines aren't fun. Uh, I have one more picture here. Uh, one of the things that Pam is doing through this ministry is she's trying to raise up leaders. Uh, and so morale's been uh, taking a leadership uh, position this year, helping out. And uh, so that's really good that you're training for the future, Pam. Uh, I like that. So a lot of, lot of neat ministries going on. We could talk about the homeless ministry. We could even talk about the gluten-free cooking class that starts on July 10. Um, yeah, I just thought for some of you, you know, when you think about gluten-free, why would you do gluten-free? Um, it's interesting uh, when you look at the climate of our country uh, today. Um, I just read this. The, uh, one in five individuals in the U.S. have adopted a gluten-free or reduced-to-gluten diet. 
uh, about 1%, they say, uh, would be considered uh, 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 celiac uh, that has to abide by something like this. Um, and then, uh, I just read this recently, uh, ab about 18 million Americans, their preference is, if they can, to eat gluten-free. <laughs> And so when we were thinking about this, you know, Jennifer and some of the team, it makes a lot of sense that we as a church would offer something to people that are trying to find an alternative. Um, and some of us have no problem eating wheat, and if you do, you should thank Jesus, right? <laughs> because those that cannot eat certain gluten foods, yeah, definitely, it is a challenge sometimes. But it's getting easier. Uh, Chick-fil-A has just decided that they now have a uh, gluten-free bun, um, which is, I mean, amazing, some of the things that are happening in the world today. And so where this is going, we don't know, but we wanted to be there for the community to just be a help so that when they think of the Standard for Gap Church, they can think about people that care enough to talk about subjects that a lot of people aren't even talking about. And so, yeah, pray for the gluten-free cooking class. Uh, it's coming up soon. Uh, today's uh, sermon title is Jesus' Declaration of Independence. Uh, and boys and girls, today the key word after I pray is declaration. So see how many times you can keep up with that word after I pray today. And then, uh, yeah, when I have that closing prayer, then you stop. Um, and then we'll see what we come up with. Uh, if by chance the speaker here today forgets to give you that number, please see me in the foyer or the lobby. Sometimes that does happen. Uh, I thought it would be, before we go to prayer right now, before I preach, uh, I thought it would be helpful, or maybe uh, at least uh, for some of you, uh, that don't do, do not read the pastor's news. If you don't get it, remember, it's just uh, email the secretary at the school, and she'll get you on the list to get the pastor's news. It's an email that comes out pretty much every Friday evening, about 4 or 5, somewhere in there. But uh, yesterday, I communicated to you some sad news about my father. How many of you read that? Did, did you read it? Okay, more of you are reading it than I thought. Uh, I put some time and effort into this because I want you to know what's going on in the church, but in this case, know what's going on in Pastor Mallory's family. They found uh, uh, cancer in my dad's blood this week, and uh, so that's, yeah, it's just pretty disturbing at this point uh, to help you understand what's going to happen next. He's going to be going to an oncologist this coming Thursday, and I will be with my mom and dad for that appointment. Um, a number of my family members are very close to dad's situation that live in Richmond, Virginia, so I'm grateful for their support, but I will be going away uh, to be with dad for that. At this point, we don't know anything, much of anything, to be honest with you, but we do know one thing, and that is that Jesus is in the healing business. Can you say amen to that? And you would think, well, 93 years old, uh, he's had many bonuses as far as his lifetime. Amen to that. He has. But I don't know about you, but I'd like to keep Dad alive a little longer. And I know one of our church members is going through this, and she said to me when we went over and anointed her, she said, you know what, Can cancer does not have to be a death sentence. And <laughs> But when you're 93 years old, it's not as easy as some. So, uh, yeah, we need to pray today. So you could bow your head with me. Father, we're not given any guarantees in this world. Even the young get sick. Even the young get cancer. Uh, this is not a good place. It's the world that we live in, we, yeah, this is the, we're trying to make the best of it, but some of us get hit, and if we don't get hit, maybe it's a loved one, maybe it's somebody that we work with, a friend. Yeah, it's all around us, and it seems like we can't escape it, even though sometimes we try to do what we can and praise the Lord for all the knowledge that's out there as far as things that we can do to live healthy, but sometimes even the best of us gets tripped up, <laughs> not only physically, but sometimes spiritually. And so, Father, today I'm your messenger. And, uh, yeah, this is going to be a very delicate subject that I'm going to talk about today. 
Um, but I'm guessing, Father, that there's somebody here today that needs to hear this message uh, because you gave it to me. Um, and I just pray that as the Spirit flows through me, that it will flow into each heart today um, and that each person, Father, will be able to get a blessing. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is definitely uh, an interesting time of the year, the first Sabbath of July. <laughs> Can you believe it? The first Sabbath of July. We're July 1 already. Seems like the summer's flying by. Uh, but yeah, well, usually when you think of early July, what do you think of? <laughs> And I'm really impressed that you are here today. A uh, number of people usually at this time of the year travel. They're gone out of town. Maybe you're still going to do that, um, but you chose to wait till tomorrow and do that. Whatever the case is, is it is a very uh, neat time of the year, especially when you think of the 4th of July holiday. Uh, somebody gave me a flag today when I came into the sanctuary, and I didn't know where to put it, so I just put it here. Uh, is that okay? Uh, is that going to bother you during the sermon? Sweetheart, does this look okay? Okay. <laughs> I always look for her for good judgment. <laughs> On the day of our wedding, we have a picture of her doing my hair uh, right before the wedding, uh, making sure everything looked just right. And according to what she said, when she said, I do, I look pretty good. And so... <laughs> Praise the Lord for that. But, I, you know, some people have OCD, and so if this is going to bother you, I'll pull it out right now, but hopefully it won't. I'm just looking at Bill Braskella here, and he's got this shirt on, and I thought at least I could do is wear the flag. But to be honest with you, I am very proud to be an American. I don't know about you. <laughs> I had the privilege to be born in this country. Some of you may be not, but, uh, yeah, this country is by no means perfect, but, hey, there sure is a lot of good here. And, uh, and I think especially when you think about freedom, what we have as a country, why do we have the holiday, the 4th of July, Independence Day? Is it all about just picnics? Uh, no, it's more than just about picnics. Uh, some of you know the history. There was 13 colonies many years ago in the 1700s that said, you know what, British uh, uh, commanders, uh, British leaders, uh, we want to be on our own. We don't like all the taxes uh, that you're putting on us, and so they met together, and they eventually were able, some of the leaders of those colonies were able to develop a document, uh, which we call the, yeah, you know all about it. And you probably remember the first part, don't you? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable uh, writes that among these are life, and there's the next part. What's the second one? Liberty. Life and liberty, yeah, and the pursuit of happiness. And that's kind of how we got started going back a number of years. Hmm, very important document. Well, friends, today you understand a document's in a document. I mean, it's a piece of paper. People have to adhere to what it says to make it work, right? <laughs> Uh, today, I would like to share with you another piece of paper, and you probably brought it with you to church. Um, and maybe you have your device, I'm not sure, but just like the Declaration of Independence, uh, this piece of paper means something, doesn't it? Can you say amen again? <laughs> it means something. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's not as small as the Declaration of Independence, but I do believe as you read the Bible, you will come upon many verses that in a lot of ways are just like that piece of paper that they had in 1776 that just pretty much sums up what God wants for his people. And as we adhere to the document or uh, the verses here in Scripture, then God really blesses us. And so today... I'm going to share with you what I believe is at least one of Jesus' declarations uh, of independence. It's a story in the Bible in John chapter 8. I will not put it up here on the screen. John chapter 8, uh, verses 2 through 36. I would like to share with you today that I believe this story is a story that was put in the Bible. It's not in the earlier man manuscripts, but it was added later. Um, I believe God put this in in the Bible uh, because there was somebody living in 2017, July 1, that needed to hear this story. 
So I have faith to believe today that while this message may be some 2,000 years old, the, the relevancy of it is still very strong. And today God wants to speak, and that's why the pastor always prays before he gets up and he preaches, because I believe the Spirit of God wants to use God's Word, His Word, to help us when it comes to our spiritual journey. So, going to verse 2. Now, early in the morning... In John chapter 8, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Jesus has done this number of times in his life, in his ministry, up to this point. Um, and this is, ends up to be looking like just a, a normal teaching occasion. But something happened that was a little different than other times, and hopefully you're there with me in your Bible or on your device. In verse 3, the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and it says, and when they had set her in the midst, verse 4, they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Hmm. Not sure exactly how it all came down here, friend, but I can tell you this, that what they did that day was all a trap. It was a trap for Jesus to try to get him to do something that would possibly jeopardize his ministry. Yeah, some people think that when they brought the woman in, it's kind of like they just threw her right there before Jesus as he's teaching. I mean, rude interruption. This woman was loved by God. And what he had to say today surely was very important, but it wasn't so important that he couldn't stop everything and minister to her. <laughs> ah, yeah. So maybe, maybe the scribes and the Pharisees had another agenda uh, for this day than Jesus did. But I can tell you this, surely this woman, even though it was very embarrassing what they did, by the end of the day, by the end of the day, friends, she was a lot better off than she was in the early morning. And so how did this all happen? Well, you know, thinking about how God would help somebody like this, um, but, but thinking also how he wanted to help the people that brought her to this point. I mean, Jesus definitely, I'm thinking, is seeing a lot more than we're seeing, than the naked eye sees uh, when you come to the story. Jesus, I believe, is actually also seeing the hearts. The heart, not of just the woman here, but he's also seeing the hearts of the people that brought her there. Well, how could he do that, you say? Well, you've got to remember Jesus is God. So he could do that through the aid of the Holy Spirit. He could see some things. He could, he could know some things prior to this occasion that allowed him that day to minister. So going to verse 5, now Moses in the law, he commanded, he commanded... <laughs> that such should be stoned. But what do you, what do you say, Jesus? What would you do, Jesus? <laughs> and so, looking at this picture, I mean, thinking, Jesus is faced with a decision. What would he do with this woman who in the social light of her day was considered very, very bad, what she did. What would Jesus do to this sinner? Continuing, uh, looking here at verse 5, the, they say that, hey, she's been caught in adultery, so we're going to argue that she should be stoned. Verse 6 says, this they said testing him that they might have something of which to do what? To accuse him. Now, 
Obviously, when you think about what Jesus could have done, and praise the Lord, he didn't, with this woman caught in adultery, he could have easily said, consented, that is, that, hey, she should be stoned. All right? He could have easily consented that. But the problem with that scenario is that the Roman government, the leaders of that time, would have said, hey, Jesus is trying to take even... Even the municipal, the, the, the secular affairs are into his hand. He's trying to uh, overrun the established laws, the government. Um, Jesus didn't want to do that. No, he didn't want to do that because that would limit his effectiveness. He could have also, very easy here, he could have also just said, you know what, you guys are, you're not teaching everything totally correct. And to be honest with you, they weren't. <laughs> They weren't really teaching everything totally correct. Not every case of adultery were you supposed to stone somebody. <laughs> Not every case. It was diff different uh, situations which warranted the stoning. So some of what they're saying is not totally correct. But also, listen to this too, and that is that if you're going to stone somebody, if you're going to punish somebody for adultery, you need to have their partner there too. And so, yeah, as much as the scribes and Pharisees might like you to think that they know it all and everything, they didn't. And so Jesus had a choice. What would he do? Well, the Bible says, yeah, look at this. The Bible says that, verse 6 again, testing them that they may have something which to accuse them, but Jesus stooped. But Jesus stooped down, and he wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not even hear the scribes and Pharisees that had brought her to him that day. <laughs> now, look at this. I mean, this is just an artist's interpretation of it. I mean, it could have been totally different from what you see here, up here on the screen. But, but I just kind of like, when I looked at this, I asked the question, what was he writing on that ground? <laughs> I mean, you think about it. What was he writing? Some of us have the benefit of having some help from the spirit of prophecy, and praise the Lord for that. Uh, but there's others out there that don't have that benefit. And one guy, he said, when I was reading, preparing for this sermon, he says, maybe Jesus was writing out the Ten Commandments. <laughs> well, that's a lot of writing on the ground there. That's what he thought. Uh, maybe he was, yeah. But I like to think also, based on what I've read from the Spirit of Prophecy, that he was writing something else. And that is, tradition actually says this, that is that when Jesus chose to write on the ground, he, he was writing something that was not only relevant to the lady that they'd brought to him that day, but he was also writing something that should have been relevant to the scribes and Pharisees. And what was that? Do you remember? Yeah. He was writing out the sins of the people that brought that lady to him that day. Now, you may think, boy, that's a jump, Pastor Mallory. How in the world <laughs> could you deduct that? Well, I think here's the way you can argue for that case. Because once he started writing all this stuff down, what did the scribes and Pharisees do? Talk to me, church. They laughed, didn't they? How have you felt when you've done something wrong and you're afraid that, yeah, somebody's going to point to you? Uh, usually, you want to try to escape. That's human nature. And so, yeah. He's just busy writing. It's interesting as you read the story that uh, continuing here. So when they continued asking him, uh, he raised himself up and he, he said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Again, give you the impression that he'd been writing something to help them to know that they're not worthy to cast the first stone. Yeah. And he again, it says in verse 8, he again stooped down and he wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, 
beginning with the oldest, even to the last. They left. And Jesus was left alone, the scripture says, and the woman standing in the midst. So, get the picture again. You're using your imagination. I mean, Jesus has these people around him, somewhat like what you see here. But then, as after he finishes writing, he, write, he wrote twice. It's interesting when you think about the Ten Commandments. Uh, God wrote on the tablets of stone twice. Uh, he wrote twice there. And then after that, everybody just disperses. They leave. <laughs> so, what would Jesus do now? Look at this, continuing verse 10. When Jesus raised himself up and saw no one, John 8, 10, and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And wow, can you imagine how she feels right now? She's probably at, at, at heard at least a little about, about Jesus and what he does. And she responds by saying, no one, Lord. And then the next part of the verse is where I find the declaration. I call it Jesus' declaration of independence. And I'm reading from the New King James Version here, but I want you to read it here up on the screen with me at the bottom. Neither... Do I condemn you? Go and sin no more. Wow. Now let's think about what he just said. <laughs> How many of you have ever used the word condemn? You ever used that before? Now, if I tell you that the house down the street is condemned, what does that mean? Talk to me. Uh, you can't live in it. And Dick says, right, it's uninhabitable. You, it, yeah, it's not the kind of place you'd want to have. Yeah. So look at this. Watch this. Jesus is essentially saying to her, you know what? You may have been uninhabitable. You may have been a really bad place. But you know what? Now, <laughs> I'm not going to condemn you anymore. It's just like, Using the house illustration again, it's just like the house has been restored, like, bang, that quick. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> now, you know, using theological terminology, when you, when you think about where she was as a sinner, and then God is pretty much saying, everything you've always done, it's canceled. I've taken care of it. You're no longer condemned. Isn't that wonderful? Can you imagine that? Wow. <laughs> John chapter 3 makes it so clear that Jesus came not into the world to condemn the world, but to do what? To save the world. And so, yes, while she because of her choices, deserved condemnation, Jesus says, you know what? I'm not going to go there with you. How could he say that, church family? How could he say that? Because he knew eventually, not too far from this moment in history, that he would take the punishment for her. Can somebody say amen to that? No matter how bad she had been, Jesus knew that his sacrifice on her behalf would make it possible for her to be led into heaven. Wow. That's what we call justification by faith. Wow. How sinners, as VBS so aptly said, how sinners can be winners. Wow, somebody with a, a, a terrible past, God could take that and he could just say, you know what, I'm going to credit my perfect righteousness to you, though your righteousness is as filthy rags. Wow, that 
is incredible what God did to this woman. Ellen White says in the book Steps to Christ, when we come to Jesus and, and submit and commit everything to him, it's like he treats us as if we've never sinned. So all of that is taken care of. God's plan of salvation, so beautiful, so loving, that he would do this for this woman. But before you leave the verse here today, understand this. Not only was God concerned about this lady's past, he was also concerned about her future. And so watch it today, friends. In John chapter 8, verse 11, neither do I condemn you, but go and do what? Sin no more. While God wants every sinner to know that they can come to him for, for forgiveness, he also wants them to know that they can come to him for power and strength to not do the same thing that got you into that situation. So while theologians preach justification and we rejoice with that, they also must talk about sanctification, how God takes a sinner and how he makes him or her, allows him or her to be able to have victory in their life. It's one thing to tell the woman caught in adultery, you're forgiven for what you've done, <laughs> and then let her go back and her old lifestyle again. It's one thing to do that. It's another thing to say, you know what, sister? I love you so much that I'm not just going to help clean up your life, but I'm going to help you stay clean. Did you hear that? I'm going to help you stay clean. And so this is what we see here as far as Jesus' declaration of independence. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Let me just share with you this experience helped this lady, helped this lady so much that, that she left that scene. She left that scene uh, a changed person. It's funny when you think about the word here, go, we see that throughout the gospel. Uh, when Jesus says go, that's his way of saying, I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you the strength to live a different life. And so she did. This book, Ministry of Healing, some of you have seen it before. Let me just share with you some good news here and a little quote here. Uh, join me. Uh, look right up here. Uh, it says, this was to her the beginning of a new life. A life of purity. Notice that word there, purity. A life of purity. And peace, devoted to God. It's kind of like, now I'm a new person. <sighs> I mean, you can just imagine how she felt. In the uplifting of this fallen soul, Jesus performed a greater miracle than in healing the most grievous physical disease. Wow. Friends, sometimes the reason people struggle physically is because they still got spiritual stuff going on. And while we as a church believe wholeheartedly in helping people find physical healing, we do not stop there. We want them to know about the spiritual healing. And it's interesting today when they did some research as far as helping people come to the spiritual part this is what they say. It's very interesting, and that is for someone to come to the part where they're really interested in spiritual things, where they may make the choice to come to church with you on Sabbath morning, sometimes it takes about three years, three years of doing health seminars, whatever, for them to finally come to that point. Whoa. She's, uh, look at this. It, it says, this miracle that God did to heal her was even, even greater than it would be for something physically. I mean, he cured, the last part of the quote, he cured, cured the spiritual malady which unto death, which is unto death everlasting. He cured it. Wow. Continuing to quote, this penitent woman became one of his most faithful, one of his most steadfast followers with self-sacrifice and love and devotion. She showed her gratitude for his forgiving mercy. Wow. 
changed woman, transformed because of an encounter with Jesus. It didn't start up so well, thrown into the midst of the crowd. Yeah, they probably had their stones in their hands. But at the end of the day, that lady was a different person. My guess is <laughs> this story, in a lot of ways, is a lot about you. It's a lot about me, too. Hmm. I ask this question to you today. How is it? How is it with your life spiritually? Let me ask you again. How is it with your life spiritually? Let me ask, if Jesus today was writing again, <laughs> oh, man, what would he be writing down about you? Her issue, obviously, was this commandment, the seventh commandment. Read it with me. You must not. You must not commit adultery. How many of you believe that? Makes sense, doesn't it? I could argue, uh, even without the Bible, for a married person to step out on their spouse, not good. And if you have kids involved, not good at all. I could argue all day. Friends, I can tell you this. There's an all-out war today in this area of purity, in this area, area of morality. There's a war by the devil himself, and he's trying to get people, even you and I, to stumble in this area. Do you hear me? I read it again. You shall not commit adultery. So that means you, if you're married you stay within that relationship that God has given you. But then some will say, well, Pastor Mallory, you just don't know the person I live with. <laughs> True, I don't know them. But let me ask you this. For those of you who are married, some of you are not married today. But before God, can you honestly say that you have done everything possible to make your marriage a good marriage? Can you honestly say that? Here's what I know. Here's what I know about the grass on the other side of the fence. It's not as good as you think it is. So, instead of nurturing the grass on the other side, why not nurture the grass on your side? Do you hear me? My wife and I started doing that a number of years ago. And I can tell you, the grass is beautiful. <laughs> but it didn't happen by accident. It's nurture. It's, it's every day thinking, what can I do to make my wife uh, happy? What can I do to nurture her? I mean, and vice versa. Yeah, the grass can be green if you nurture it, if you water it. So before God, if God asks you today, what are you doing in your marriage, husband and wife, to make your marriage the best it could be? But you say, Pastor Mal, you don't know what happened earlier in our marriage. True, true, I don't know that. But there is something called forgiveness. And if you're still struggling with that, Go to get some help. Because jumping out of your marriage and hooking up with somebody else, that's not going to solve everything. And so, yeah, 
you must not commit adultery. And I will say on a side note, if you have, if you've made some bad choices in the past, that's why the story of the woman caught in adultery is in the Bible, to help you know that God still loves you and that he can take the wrecks of society and make something beautiful out of them. Yeah, true. Yeah, he can do that. But let me just share this with you. When I looked at the, the seventh commandment, I realized by reading the spirit of prophecy that we're talking about more than just stepping out of a marriage here and going into a full-blown physical affair. We're talking about something that happens in the mind. Look at this quote here. It says, uh, this commandment forbids not only acts of impurity, actions, if you want to use that word, but sensual thoughts and desires or any practice that tends to excite them. Purity is demanded not only in the outward life, but in the what? In the secret intents and emotions of the heart. Have you noticed today, friends, the onslaught of stuff in the media to cause us to have lustful thoughts? Can you see that? I mean, we've been bombarded with all kinds of stuff hating us on the Internet. Bang, there it is. You see it. And so as you think about how to relate to adultery, remember, it's not just the guy that steps out on his wife and has a full-blown affair. Adultery is also somebody that's looking at stuff or reading stuff that has impure thoughts. And so it behooves us as God's people living the last seconds of earth's history to do what we can to keep our minds pure, which may mean that we may have to get along with a track phone instead of a smartphone. Do you hear me? It may mean that we may have to put filters on our computer. Moms and dads, listen to me. Earlier and earlier, kids are getting messed up with pornography on the Internet. And you don't think it's happening? Think again. We have to be leaders, spiritual leaders in our home, and not let the devil just take our young boys and our young girls and let him ruin them. We must be spiritual leaders. Well, the kids are not going to like it. You know what? They may not like it now, but in the long run, they'll say, thank you, Mom and Dad, for giving me some boundaries. I mean, this is the world that we're living in. We're being attacked with sexual immorality, and it's starting here. And so we have to make decisions that will protect us so that we don't end up in situations that could be really, really bad for not just us, but for our kids and whoever is impacted. Purity. God wants that. Purity is demanded, not only in the outward life, but in the secret intents and emotions of the heart. And so, again, I ask you today, how is it with you? How is it with your mind? <laughs> how is it with your thoughts? What are you looking at, friend? <laughs> what are you thinking about? Continuing here in Ministry of Healing, she says, Jesus, yeah, he knows the circumstances of every soul. He knows your battle. He knows exactly what you're going through right now. <laughs> the greater the sinner's guilt, the more he needs the Savior. I can say amen to that. His heart of divine love and sympathy is drawn out most of all for the one who is the most helplessly entangled in the snare of the enemy. Did you hear the wording here? Hopelessly, hopelessly entangled. That means all tied up. That's somebody that's addicted, all right? Yeah, you don't want to do it, but you do it. That's somebody that's struggling with something in their life. 
and it could very well be secret sin, most hopelessly entangled in the snares of the enemy, Jesus' love and his sympathy is drawn out to that kind of person. And then, and then, here it is, the quote that, that I saw and I said, oh, this can't be true. Yeah, it is. Read it with me. With his own blood, he has signed the emancipation papers of the race. With his own blood. <laughs> with his own blood. I love Thomas Jefferson and those forefathers, but I love Jesus even more. <laughs> wow, the Declaration of Independence spiritually means that me, a sinner, can find freedom from sin. That is good news. Jesus does not desire those who've been purchased at such a cost to become the sport of the enemy's temptations. He does not desire us to be overcome and perish. He who curbed the lions in their den and walked with his faithful witnesses amid the fiery flames is just as ready to work in our behalf to subdue, notice the next word, every, every evil in our nature. Today, he's standing at the altar of mercy. Amen to that. He's, he's our high priest in the sanctuary above. Whoa. Presenting before God the prayers of those, of those even at the Stanford Gap Church this morning, who desire his help. He turns no weeping, contrite one away freely. Will he pardon all who come to him for forgiveness and restoration? Oh, that's powerful stuff. I got it closed today, but I will tell you, in John chapter 8, this chapter is loaded. I want to share with you another text here. Read it with me. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Freedom, liberty, independence from sin. That's what God wants for his people. That's what he wants for his community. Romans chapter 8. I want to finish with this verse. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Wow. Wow. So today, friends, if you feel like that woman thrown out into the midst, caught in a terrible situation and a tangled web, trying to figure out how in the world that you can get out, the good news is, is Jesus is there. And just as much as he helped this woman get back on her spiritual feet, he can do the same for you. So today, I ask you, would you like to say today, Jesus... <laughs> I, want, I, I just want your help in my life. I want to stay pure today. I want you to raise your hand if you want to say that today. Jesus, help my mind to stay pure. One more question. Jesus, help my steps to stay straight so I don't venture off into some spiritual ditch that will ruin me. If you'd like to say that today, just raise your hand. I got my hand up too. Let us pray. Father, today, we thank you so much for July 4, Independence Day. But, Father, we realize <laughs> in a lot of ways, Lord, we've had Independence Day here at Standard for Gap this morning just as much and even better than the independence from the British is independence from sin. And so when we look at the woman caught in adultery... It was pretty clear the declaration, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. Those words were meant for us too. So we come today as we are. None of us haven't done it perfectly. Some of us, Lord, have struggled very hard to keep our minds pure. And we've fallen time and time again. But thank you, Jesus, that each time we fall, that you're always there to pick us up. And thank you so much, Lord that you're there to help us have better minds, to help us, Lord, to have better marriages, to help us, Lord, to have such a close walk with you. 
that when the devil comes knocking with his temptations, that by your grace, we can say no. So thank you so much that you use the story of this woman to help us all when it comes to the spiritual journey. Father, today, I just pray that when we leave this place today, that if we need to make some tough decisions about what we do with what we see and what we listen to, that you will empower us to do that. That you would even empower us to have an accountability partner to make sure, Lord, that we're making good decisions. Whatever it takes, Father, help us. I pray for every home today that's represented here in this church. I pray, dear Lord, that you would send the holy angels to protect every family, Lord, because I know the devil wants to wreck homes. So I pray for all of our homes that are represented, not just here, but even in our community. Thank you, Jesus, for being a powerful, mighty Savior. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Declaration was used seven times today. Uh, and so, boys and girls, make sure you take note of that. 27 is our closing hymn, Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart. Join me as we sing. Please stand. Rejoice ye pure in heart. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for bringing us here today. Be with us now as we go our separate ways. Protect us. Help us as we think about the week ahead. Uh, yeah, keep you first. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.